personalization webinar, part of the Iterative Marketing Success Webinar Series hosted by Brilliant Metrics. Brilliant Metrics is a consultancy on a mission to eliminate waste in marketing. They help brands and agencies measure, optimize, and automate their marketing. Today's presenter is Steve Robinson, founder and CEO of Brilliant Metrics. Steve is the host of the Iterative Marketing Podcast, a weekly podcast that explores the strategies, tactics, and concepts you can apply to achieve measurable and continuous improvement in your marketing efforts. Steve is also an instructor and advisor for the Digital Marketing Program at UW-Milwaukee School of Continuing Education. Steve's background includes a mixture of marketing and software development with an emphasis on where marketing and technology intersect. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Steve to get things kicked off. Thank you, Taylor. So for today's webinar, what we'll be talking about is uh, we're going to go through four things. First, we'll talk about the definition of marketing personalization and kind of level set on what that means. We'll talk about the why behind marketing personalization. Why is, it, why is it important to personalize your marketing? Obviously, if you're attending today's webinar, you see this as important, but uh, it might be helpful to go through some uh, particular benefits if you need to sell this within the organization or to a client. We'll talk about segmentation because you really can't do marketing personalization until you have segmented your audience effectively. And then finally, we'll go through four different places you can personalize your marketing and how to go about doing that. We'll, of course, leave plenty of time for questions, but feel free to post your questions at any time into the chat box. I should also mention that uh, throughout the webinar, there will be repeated references to The Princess Bride. So for those of you that have fond memories of that movie, this will be a little bit fun. And for those of you that you know don't know what we're talking about, that's okay, too. When we talk marketing personalization, we're really talking about the definition of getting the right message to the right audience at the right time. So that means that your prospects, your customers, your target audience is going to get to the content that they need based on who they are and where they are and then where they are in the buyer's journey or where they have progressed through your funnel. Why do we need to personalize our marketing? Well, essentially, there are three core reasons why marketing personalization is, is, is important to any organization today. The first is what I call the Amazon effect. So if you think about your own habits as a consumer and the brands that you interact with, when you log into a site like Amazon, you have come to expect a certain degree of personalization. And you can see, you know, my Amazon profile on the left over there is telling me that uh, uh, I need to buy some jewelry for my wife. And quite frankly, I think it's probably on, on, on the right track there. I'm going to trust it and, and, and follow through on that. Same thing is true of your Netflix queue. It's going to, based on your activity, make a recommendation of what content it thinks that you're going to like. So as we grow more accustomed to seeing this personalization in the brands that we interact with online, it becomes an expectation of all brands that we interact with. And that's whether uh, we're in a B2C organization or in a B2B organization, we're expecting the brand to cater its digital presence to our needs and our habits and our preferences. The second reason why it's important that every organization implements some degree of marketing personalization is because sales or human interaction arrives much later in the game now. So as consumers begin to research your product or service, they wait until they have to to talk to a person. If you think about the last time that you bought a car, you probably walked into the dealership knowing exactly which make, model you wanted, and all of the options that you wanted and had a rough idea of how much it should cost. You maybe had a couple of questions for the salesperson and, and more or less just wanted to test drive that car and make sure uh, it, it met your expectations. Contrast that to going back to maybe 15 years ago where you'd walk into the dealership, you maybe talk to a neighbor about their car, maybe you talk to your mechanic about what to look for, but for the most part, the salesperson really helped drive that, that selection experience and they held all the information. What that meant was that the salesperson was able to personalize their presentation to you. They could ask you questions about your needs. They could ask you about your family, your commute, and really get to the heart of what you needed out of a car and really only show you the options that were important to you. Since we as consumers don't want to talk to the salesperson until the last minute, now as brands, we need to make sure that we're giving that same level of personalization before a human is involved, which means personalizing the marketing experience, not just the sales experience. 
Finally, marketing personalization can help reduce waste. If you are delivering the right message to the right person at the right time, that means that you're not delivering the wrong message to the wrong person at the wrong time. In the case of, of paid media, that means you're saving money on media. In all other cases, there's an opportunity cost because you have a finite amount of attention that you're going to be able to get out of your audience. And if you're delivering the wrong message at the wrong time, then your audience isn't going to be getting the right message. So by personalizing your marketing, you are essentially reducing waste in your entire marketing channel and within your marketing content by delivering the right content to the right person. Before we can get into how to personalize marketing, I think it's really important that we talk about segmentation. Segmentation is key when it comes to personalizing your marketing because if you don't have segmenta a segmentation strategy, then you aren't able to put your audience into boxes to give them different content. Segmentation is just that. It's putting your audience into the boxes that they need to be in in order to personalize or customize the content that they're going to receive. There are a number of ways you can segment your audience. My personal favorite is to segment by persona. Persona segmentation is setting up a, a persona, a, a straw man, a fictitious individual to represent a larger segment of your audience. This persona then can help you identify the key psychographic differences of this group of audience or your, of your audience compared to the rest of it. This includes things like their frustrations, their aspirations, why your brand matters to them, as well as contextual clues, what's going on in their life, what's, uh, do they have kids, what sort of distractions, what is their work environment, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that can really help you personalize that content and make sure that that content is exactly what that audience member needs at that particular moment. Usually personas are not enough. So if you're in a B2B organization, you're not just looking at your personas, but you're looking at other segmentation variables, things like industry. So here we have insurance, healthcare, and legal, as well as maybe role or seniority within the organization or decision-making ability. Is this a decision-maker or an influencer? If you cross-reference that with your personas, you can get a really good visual representation of who you're trying to customize content for so that you can set up your personalization strategy moving forward. If you're B2C, your matrix might look something like this, where maybe you're breaking it down by economic or level of product and uh, different attributes about what matters to those individuals. Regardless, you want to come up with a segmentation, segmentation strategy that works for you, that allows you to get that right message to the right person. Now that leaves the right time. So how do we go about doing that? We talk about getting the message to the right time. This is where the customer journey comes in. If you haven't taken the time to document your customer journey or your buyer's journey, the path that somebody goes from not knowing you and you not knowing them all the way through to being your biggest advocate in the marketplace. If you haven't taken the time to, to document that, I strongly encourage that you do so. And then figure out how to segment your audience accordingly. For us, we like to use Avinash Kaushik's See, Think, Do model. In the See, Think, Do model, you have five states, at least as we have adapted it. The first state is C. In the C state, your prospect is qualified, but in no way are they thinking or considering your product or service. The key point here is that they're qualified. That means that they, they, are a, they have a potential need for your product or service in the future. That also means they have the economic means to purchase it. So if you're selling Mercedes, then the person has to have a driver's license, they have to potentially uh, need a car, and they have to be of, a, of the economic stature to, to buy a Mercedes. Your think state is going to be when that prospect is not only qualified, but now they're in a position where they've started thinking about either making a change in vendor if you're on the B2B side, or they've started thinking about making a purchase in the future on the B2C side. So for example, coming back to my car example, if I'm driving my car and my check engine light comes on, that's going to move me into the think state because now I'm trying to weigh the cost of repairs versus replacement. In your do state, the prospect is qualified. They've made a commitment, but now they've made a commitment to themselves or to someone else to actually follow through on that purchase. So this is when you've decided that you're going to buy the car. The question is which one and from where, but you've made that commitment to yourself or maybe your spouse or maybe your boss in a B2B context to make a purchase. The last two states apply to your customers. 
So this is after they've made a purchase decision and they're now part of your customer base. At that point, you have two states, grow and give. Grow is when your customer is a loyal customer. They're going to at least consider you first for their next purchase, but they're not at the point where they're singing your praises to others. Your give state is when not only are they a loyal customer, but now they're also an advocate for your brand in the marketplace. This means that they're posting online reviews or that they are referring you to other potential prospects. We look at um, the different ways that you can segment. So we talked about segmenting by persona or other attributes like industry or economic status or in interest. And then we also looked at segmenting across your different states within your buyer's journey. That covers segmentation. Now we can dive into what you can personalize. The four areas that I wanna to cover today for personalization are web, social, email, and ads. Each one of these has a little bit difference in how you go about personalizing and what personalization looks like, and I'll show examples for each one. Let's start with web. How do you personalize your website? Well, the key is identifying when someone arrives on your website, what segment they're in, and then changing the content accordingly. I'll give you an example here. This is from a company called Demandbase. Demandbase offers an ABM product, an account-based marketing product. Their product also includes a website personalization component. And so this is an example of a landing page that was published by Citrix. And as you can see, this is targeted at the financial industry. It says transform business through powerful financial IT solutions. Now you look at when they were able to identify using the IP address that the visitor was coming from a company that was healthcare, they changed the message. So in this case, we're talking about healthcare mobility. Same thing is true if that person was coming from higher ed. So the technology takes a look at the network that the person's coming in from, and then from the information that they're able to sniff from that network, they can go match that up against a database of known companies in the world and figure out which company, what industry they're in, how big they are, and any other information you might be able to use to tailor the message to apply to somebody within that company. So it's not down at the individual basis, but it can be at the company basis. Contrast that with going to the other end of the extreme. If you own a web property that people can log into, now you have the opportunity to actually personalize down to that individual. And so this gets into that Amazon experience. This is really common for e-commerce companies, but also any membership site can do this. The technology is based around recommendation engines. So they take a look at the individual users on the platform, what their usage patterns look like, find other users on the platform who have similar usage patterns, and then they're able to recommend content or product based on those usage patterns. It can be very powerful, but you have to have engaged, logged in users in order to be able to do this. If you're running a marketing automation system, chances are you can do some web-based CRM personalization. So this is where you're personalizing based on their record in your marketing database. This is an example from um, Marketo in their real-time personalization product. They had, had a case study for a company called BlueJeans that sold, a, sold to a variety of B2B organizations. In this case, BlueJeans was able to personalize the web experience if they were able to identify the person coming in was within a particular industry or vertical in their database. So here they're providing a healthcare testimonial because the, uh, the person coming in was identified as being in the healthcare industry but you're able to match this up against any attribute that you have in your database, including persona, industry, maybe job title, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, you can do behavioral personalization. This is a case study from a, a company called Personize. If you wanna play with website personaliz personalization and don't wanna invest a bunch of money into a tool right away, Personize can be a great tool to do that because they have a free trial and um, it's, it's a great little playground. So in this instance, Personize, they took this travel website, and if you came in and were looking at ski packages, the next time you came back to visit the site, you didn't get the normal homepage. You got a homepage that was personalized towards ski packages. Now, no, we don't have to know who's on the other side of that screen. We don't have to know the actual visitor to our website. They don't have to be in any database. They don't have to log in. All we have to do is track their activity on our site and then create a very customized experience for their next visit or later in that same visit. So that covers web. What about email? How do we personalize email? 
When it comes to email personalization, we have two different vectors that we can personalize on. The first one is sender personalization. So if you received an invitation to this particular webinar, that invitation may have come from a variety of different people. If you were an existing client, that invitation came from your account manager. If you were not an existing client, that invitation probably came from me. We're able to do this personalization by simply matching up the record in our database and matching up whether that's an existing customer, and if so, who's their account manager, and then personalizing the signature and sender name accordingly. This is very powerful personalization for two reasons. First of all, it's going to really increase your open rate on your emails. Secondly, it solves that problem of sales not being involved early in the process, because if you're able to match up an individual prospect record with their appropriate salesperson, you can get that salesperson's name and possibly image in front of that prospect long before they're ready to talk to anyone. We're not limited, though, to only sender personalization. We can also personalize content. So in this instance, what you're looking at is two different emails here. One of them is uh, an inbound email that was targeted at me. It's asking me to jump into a conversation based on the other conversations that I had jumped in. Basically, inbound had detected from my activity on the site that I'm really into analytics. And so they saw a conversation out there about analytics and personalized an email to me asking me to jump in. Quora does the same thing. If you're on Quora, they'll find questions that, based on other questions that you've answered, they assume that you'll also know the answer to this one as well. You don't have to have a community site like this to do this sort of content personalization, though. You can simply take your email newsletter and swap out a block in it based on the person who's going to be receiving it. So that could be as simple as recommending the appropriate article for them to read or changing up the call to action on that newsletter based on where they are in the buyer cycle so that your existing customers are being asked to either explore other services or products that you offer or recommend you, whether they're grow or give, or changing it up so that people who are in C-State are asked to dive into maybe some ThinkState content, things like videos or white papers or other ebooks instead of driving right to, hey, do you want to buy from us today? That covers email. What about advertising? How do we personalize advertising? Well, when you look at advertising, there's a couple of different ways you can do the personalization. Again, it comes back to your segmentation. How can you figure out the segment that your audience is in when they receive an ad? And then how do you change the ad content accordingly? So what you see on the screen right now, we have an ad on the left-hand side that targets individuals in the think state. In this case, we're just asking them to download a guide. We're not asking them to, to buy or, or commit to a purchase of, of any IT services. Now on the right-hand side, what you see is we see an ad that is targeting people who are in the do state. So these people are ready to buy. So in this case, we're offering a, a voucher for free services. That's not going to interest anybody who isn't ready to buy today. So we don't deliver the ad to those people. We can do the same thing based on industry preference. The ad on the left is targeting the wholesale industry, the ad on the right is targeting the cargo industry, and the imagery and message changes slightly accordingly. We're targeting the wholesale industry, an image of a warehouse is perfectly applicable, but the cargo industry doesn't warehouse anything, so instead we show a cargo containers on a ship. Now how do we get these ads into the, into the, to the eyeballs of the appropriate audience segments? To do that, we have a couple of different targeting methods at our disposal. The first and the easiest is something called CRM re retargeting, and it's not really retargeting because this, these could just as easily be new audience members for this particular um, advertising campaign. But in the case of CRM re retargeting, what you do is you take a dump of those people in your database and take those segments and upload them as lists to an ad platform. AdRoll is a great platform if you're looking for a place to do this. Otherwise, you can uh, look at there's different onboarding technologies depending on how you or your agency is serving up their ads to enable you to match email addresses to individuals' browsers. Once you've uploaded that list, you're able to direct advertising at particular different segments of your audience. There are a couple limitations. You need to note that CRM retargeting will only match maybe 30 to 50% of your list, depending on how many of those email addresses are in the database that they're trying to match against browser cookies. And you have to have a large enough list for each segment that you're targeting in order for it to work. So usually that has to be somewhere between 50 and 100 on the, on the low end of individuals that you're targeting for an individual segment. If you don't have that many people, then some privacy restrictions start to come into play because they really don't want you being able to follow an individual around the internet. So they require a certain minimum number of people in each segment. You don't have to just do CRM retargeting, though. 
You can also use other retargeting methods that are available to everybody in more advanced ways. For example, here, let's say we have an audience. They're visiting our website. We don't even know who they are. We don't have their email address or anything. They're not in our database. But we see that their patterns are engaging with do state content on our website. So they're looking at things like a pricing page. We know that they are in market and ready to buy now. So we add them to a retargeting pool by dropping a cookie on their computer to be able to display them ads in the future. And we call this our do retargeting pool. We can do the same thing based on the type of content that they're engaging with. So say that we have another audience of people that comes to our website. They're engaging with content that is specific to the insurance industry. Maybe they've come to a page where they can download a, a white paper for insurance professionals. We add them to our insurance pool because we know that they are in the insurance industry. Now, if we have sufficient volume of people visiting our website, we can take our advertising platform and say, we want to advertise to people who are in our do retargeting pool and people that are in our insurance retargeting pool. And then set up ads that are specific to do state insurance industry professionals. Next up, we'll talk about social media. How can you personalize your social media presence? Unfortunately, I have some slightly bad news on this. In order to personalize your social media presence, you're going to have to leverage paid social media. You're not able to do this through the normal organic social media where you put a post out and all of your followers or likes get that particular post. The reason why you have to do this through paid is because if you think about it, you have no idea who or why followed your brand on social media. It could be that they were applying for a job for your organization. It could be that they have a friend that works there. It could be that they were looking at your product or service once or were considering referring you. You don't really know why they liked you at any given point. So to nail down a specific audience, you really have to use the paid targeting tools to be able to get to them. A couple of examples of how you can personalize, and this, this, these are, again, examples from our own client work. You can see on the left here, we have a Facebook ad that is targeting roofing contractors. So in this instance, we're asking them if they want a free sample, and we're talking about how they can protect the roofs that they're installing. Contrast that with the one on the right. Again, same thing. We're giving away sample kits, but in this instance, we're calling it a sales kit because, well, a distributor doesn't care about a sample. And we're talking about how they can help better serve their contractors that are coming in to buy their product. Another example on Twitter, here we're targeting uh, different content at different points in the buyer's journey. So for our think state audience, we don't want to be pushing product on them. We want to be pushing more information on what they need to be thinking about when they go to buy. So you see we have an example of a video that they can watch. For our due state, however, we're actually pushing individual product on that particular audience because we know they're ready to buy. They just need to select the product and, and the vendor that they're going to purchase from. How do we get this content in the right audience at the right time? Well, you can use the demographic information of the individual's profiles on certain networks to target, but you can get a lot more exact than that. Just like advertising can allow you to do CRM retargeting, most social networks allow you to do CRM targeting. And in this instance, it actually has a higher match rate than your CRM retargeting on your, on your advertising. And there are more things that you can match on. Most platforms allow you to match on email address, but Facebook also allows you to match on phone number. So if you have a database of prospects and you have their email address and phone number, you can upload all of that information into Facebook and it will find those people. Twitter will allow you to match on, on Twitter usernames. So as you're filling in your database, it's important that your sales team knows to go out and hunt and find those Twitter usernames and add them to the list. Once you have those people in your system, you're able to target them directly based on their segmentation in your, in your CRM so that you're getting exactly the right message to the right person at the right time. You can also fall back again to traditional retargeting, where based on their activity, either on the social network or on your website, you can serve up different content for them. So in this instance, we have a Facebook video that only someone of our Paula persona would watch. Say it's on yoga practice. We're able to build up a retargeting pool based on all of the people who watched that video. We've also, based on activity on our website, identified anybody who's think or do. 
Not only can you combine and figure out the intersection between two audiences, but most platforms, including all the major social ones, let you take and exclude certain audiences. So we exclude anybody who's thinking uh, about buying our product or service or anybody who's ready to buy our think and do audience. And now we have all of our Paulas that are into yoga but aren't further down our buyer's journey than C, and we can target C state ads at the people who need to see them at that time. So these are ads that aren't pushing product. Maybe it's another lifestyle type video to get our brand in front of them. It's a way to get the right content to the right person at the right time again. So that brings us to the end of the content. I'm just gonna sum up what we've learned today here quickly, and then we'll open this up to questions. First, personalization is about getting the right message to the right person at the right time. Segmentation is key to doing that personalization. You have to have your audience in the appropriate buckets. If you don't, then you don't know what content to get to what people, and you don't know when they should be receiving that content. Persona and journey state are two very, very powerful segmentation strategies. And then when we go to personalize, we can personalize in four different areas, web content, email, advertising, and social media. Finally, from a tool basis, you're going to want to leverage your CRM system, your marketing automation system if you have one, and if you're in B2B, consider an account-based marketing solution. All of them give you different tools to help you personalize your marketing. And then finally, what allows us to do the personalization on social media and advertising is basic retargeting technology. We're just taking that retargeting technology and using it differently. At this point, I'd like to open up to questions. So we have a couple of questions that people have submitted via the chat box. So Samantha asks if CRM retargeting only matches 30 to 50% of your audience, is it really worth it? Well, um, to answer your question, Samantha, yes. Even though you're only matching 30 to 50% of your audience, if you think about it, you are getting exactly the right people with no room for error, with exactly the right message. And that's invaluable, even if it is a small number. And you only pay for the media that's delivered anyway. So your media costs reduce along with the size of the audience that you're targeting. George asks, um, I've set up personalization. Now how do I make sure that I'm delivering the right content to the right time of the right person? That's a good question, George. What you're going to be looking at is uh, um, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate metrics in place to, in order to be able to analyze the results on the other side. That would be looking at things like click-through rate, things like quality of traffic on your website, or uh, even conversion rate or revenue. And if you're able to track that stuff through, what you should see is that your personalized content should well outperform media or content that you are delivering that isn't personalized. So your personalized web pages should have a higher time on site than the ones that end up not being personalized or more pages per visit. Your personalized ad should have a higher click-through rate than, your, than the ones that you're forced to deliver unpersonalized. And as long as you're comparing stats that are running concurrently, you should be able to see the lift. If you don't see a lift, then something's not quite right. Uh, Robert asks, I don't know a lot about personas and journeys. Where should I start? Well, we've got a couple of great blog posts out on the Iterative Marketing community. Um, if you uh, go out to iterativemarketing.net, you can Google that, as well as a couple of podcast episodes. And I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but um, on the Iterative Marketing Podcast, we have done a few episodes on personas and journeys, and I think they turned out pretty well and definitely worth a listen. Sarah asks, how do I push my audiences to the do state and get them to buy faster? Okay, so I think this is a great question, and it opens up a bit of a can of worms, but I'll try to be quick about this. You want to, you, when you look at targeting your media and personalizing your media based on buyer's journey, it's not so much a matter of pushing people to the next uh, next stage in the buyer's journey. It's more about giving them exactly the right message at the right time. Now, that said, you're going to want to make sure that you are providing some content for the next stage for your audience, for the stage that they're in. I know I did a poor job of explaining that, but let me, let me try again. 
if you're targeting media at your C state audience, you assume they're in C, but they may actually be further down the buyer's journey than that or may get further down the buyer's journey. You want to be able to detect that and move them. So you're going to want to dangle a little bit of think state content in front of your C audience. The majority of it is stuff that apply to anyone, regardless of whether they're in market for your product or service or not. But a little bit of it should be more specific to your product or service and indicate some, some desire or intent or some thought about your product or service. That way you know if they engage with that content, you can adjust all of your retargeting pools and, and, and if you can detect it, impact, impact their record in your database, et cetera, et cetera. Then if they move to think, you're going to do the same thing with some do state content. Dangle that in front of them a little bit so that they know that um, you know if they're actually do, even though you're targeting them with think. We cover this more in depth, and uh, again, in one of our podcast episodes on, on the Iterative Marketing Podcast, if you want to go check that out. And uh, I think there will be a blog post forthcoming at some point to, to dive into that a little bit more detail. So I think that's a wrap. I want to thank everyone for your time today. I greatly appreciate it. There are other webinars in the series. I encourage you to go to the iterativemarketing.net, take a look at the other, other webinars in the Iterative Marketing Marketing Success Series, as well as the Brilliant Metrics website. If you want to reach me, my email address is steve.robinson at brilliantmetrics.com, and I'm Steve Robinson on Twitter. Thank you to everyone for your time today, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time.